Riley, order up. Table 12. My father, Maximilian Gibson, yelled from the kitchen. He's the owner of Max's American Bistro. He's the man in charge, and one very good and very fast cook. He also pays me a fair wage because I live on my own at the frat house, so I can't complain. I ran back to the kitchen, compared the plates to the tickets, and then took the plates to table number 12. Dad had a huge menu of more than 50 things for the customers to choose from, though the classic burger and the chili cheese fries were the most popular. Friday nights are busy. One of the local bands played. Tonight, it was a set of jazz musicians called Milwaukee Nights. We have 24 indoor tables and another 18 outdoor tables. Customers filled every table, and those that couldn't get in had to wait 30 minutes. Max's American Bistro specialized in steaks and specialty burgers and garlic cheddar fries. We don't use regular ketchup, but ones that are made from Dad's custom recipes, like spicy ketchup, garlic ketchup, and the ever-popular tomato specialty sauce. We make our own bread, and hamburger buns, and hot dog rolls, and the best chocolate chip cookies in the world. The woman who bakes for us was a pastry chef who used to work full-time at Do Me a Favor until she had a baby, and now she works part-time for us. Dad changes the menu every month, making sure to customize according to whatever is in season. He's a genius with food, and I doubt the bistro would survive long without his vision. In addition to me and Dad and the baker, Mom handled scheduling and seating. My sister helped handle tables. Plus, we had nine other people working the tables, plus a bartender and two teenagers who only bust tables. Dad had two chefs helping him in back and two dishwashers. We easily needed another two people to bust the tables, and when Dad took a day off, it took two additional chefs to replace him. I'm Riley Gibson, a 21-year-old sophomore working on a degree in business management with a minor in accounting. I have about as much time for a social life as you would expect. None. I barely made my frat obligations. I've known I've wanted to open my own restaurant for a long time, but that goal is a long ways away, and it seems to be getting further. Dad only closes the bistro down about six on Sunday nights, so my parents can attend Sunday evening mass. Even though I don't live at home, we go as a family. It's mom's way of feeling religious, and I suspect she's trying to save my soul, but she is too polite to say that. Father Waring, our parish priest, is usually pretty friendly. He knows I'm openly and actively gay. We've spoken about it at length over the years. He even makes a point to try and make me feel welcome. My parents don't make an issue of me being gay because they're afraid that if they do, it will drive me away not only from the church, but from the family. It did for six months back in high school when I began dating my first boyfriend. Riley, order up, table four, Dad yelled from the back. I picked up the food for table four and brought it to them. There's this guy I've been staring at all night and he sits at table four. Good-looking guys are not unusual around here. Good-looking guys that aren't interested in me are. Every so often, I caught him looking at me. I don't know why, because I'm pretty plain with my dirty blonde hair and brown eyes, and I'm always tired, and I'm currently wearing the bistro uniform, a wrinkled red t-shirt that said, the only thing better than eating at Max's American Bistro is working there. Nobody would ever call me a fashion maven. I keep telling Dad that red is not the color to wear in Vegas heat because it shows every drop of sweat. And he has too many words on the shirt for people to read. Dad's comment, it's my bistro and I can do whatever I want. The man at table four had green eyes, 
wavy hair with long bangs, casually styled, and a gold hoop in each ear, and a tat on his left arm that looked like it could be a dragon snaking around his arm. His face had that casual, sculpted scruff that meant he kept himself well-groomed. He wore a turquoise, short-sleeved shirt, expensive-looking khaki shorts, and dark brown hiking boots. The sun had bronzed his skin. This man lived outdoors. A lot. Whatever he did for a living, it kept him in shape. I'd never seen him here before. A first-timer? He dined with a man and a woman who had been here before. But he seemed comfortable enough. Was he gay? He stared at me and quickly looked away. Did I dare take a chance? Did I dare ask him? Would I even have time to ask him out? With the size of the crowd tonight, probably not. I dropped off their food just in time for Dad to yell, Riley, order up, table 20. Generally, each waiter or waitress was in charge of four or five tables, but Dad had them scattered around the room. If I was in charge, I'd organize it more efficiently. I stopped by table four about ten minutes later and asked, Anything I can get you? May I recommend a slice of cheesecake? Or a slice of our authentic Italian cream cake? Or would you prefer something a little lighter? A scoop of gelato? Tonight's flavors are mango, chocolate chip, blueberry, and lime. His green eyes met mine. And then the woman said, I think we'll just take the check, please. By the way, give our compliments to the chef. He's my dad, and he'll be pleased you liked the food, I quickly answered. Wally, I told you you'd like this place. Max makes everything fresh, the woman at the table said, but glanced at the man I was interested in. Dad bargains with the farmer's market to get the best organic produce, I said. No wonder the food is so good, she said. This is my fiancé, Tom, and this is his brother, Wally. It's Wally's first night in Vegas. Wally was the man who I had caught looking at me. Wally avoided my gaze, as if he were slightly embarrassed by the unexpected introduction. I turned to him and asked, Where are you from? Phoenix, he said. My soon-to-be brother-in-law needs a job, the woman said. Are you hiring? He knows how to cook because he used to work at El Paraiso. Maybe you've heard of it. It's a nice place in Phoenix. And then Wally softly whined. Not tonight. Sorry, I said. We don't have any openings right now. You can go online to fill out an application. Or Mom, she's the lady handling seating, has some applications at the reception desk. I went to the computer to calculate their bill. And on the way back, I did two things. I stopped by the reception and picked up a job application. And I wrote my phone number on the customer copy of the receipt, along with a little note. Would you be willing to go on a date with me? I'll show you around Vegas. And I signed it, Riley. I brought the bill back, gave Wally the application, and the woman read the note and said, I'm sorry, but I'm in a relationship with Tom. I told you he was my fiancé, remember? I quickly looked at the bill, feeling the heat in my cheeks, and said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean you. I'm gay, and I meant Wally. I think he's really handsome, and I'd like to show him the sights. I nodded towards Wally. The woman had a puzzled look about her eyes. Then she glanced as her fiancé teased, saying, I keep telling you that sometimes things aren't about you. Wally looked at the number, then looked at me, and quietly said, I'm sorry, but I'll have to say no. I don't even have an apartment yet, and all my stuff arrives on Monday, which we will put straight into storage. Not a good time to be social. Which meant he probably wasn't gay and trying to let me down nicely. Not the first time I've been shot down. And probably not the last, either. I mumbled a quick, no problem, don't worry about it. Wally is slumming off of us for a couple of weeks, until he gets things sorted, Tom said. It's okay, I said. When life settles down, and if you're interested, give me a call. Technically... 
was this a near miss? Or was it a nice way of saying, I bombed? A minute later, I returned to process their debit card, and they left soon after. They did leave a nice tip. About eleven, business finally slowed down, but because of the band and a late night party, people didn't leave until closing, which was about one. Another hour to clean and get the restaurant ready for Saturday, and I could head home, exhausted. Here's the first problem. I have a 10-page paper to write for my Intro to Business Management class, and the professor wanted us to write in-depth about an already existing business. I chose my family's bistro. My teacher had issues with my rough draft because I chose to focus on a small business. He wanted me to research some Fortune 500 company and their business model and write about that. I would rather get his feedback on how to make the bistro more customer friendly and maybe more profitable. I want to take my own ideas and create my own restaurant. I needed input about our current business, not some mega company. Trigger a massive writer's block. The paper is due Monday and all I have is a rough draft the teacher scribbled over with a ton of red ink. I'm not doing very well in this class. Which brings me to the bigger problem. Once I got back to the frat house, I walked up to my third floor room to discover a tie draped over the door handle. Again, Chaz's personal do not disturb sign. This is getting very old. Chaz Shepard, my roommate from hell. He is your classic entitled frat boy who is rich, though not as rich as Anders. He's handsome, though not as handsome as Hutch. He thinks he's athletic, though he's not as athletic as Twitch or Howard. And he thinks he's smart, but not as smart as Albrecht. Albrecht is a genius with an IQ that reaches the stratosphere. Chaz's parents pay for everything. Not like William who drives an Uber to pay the bills, or me who has to work at the bistro all the time, or Grin who entertains at parties. Chaz both sleeps all the time and sleeps around all the time, and for some reason he still gets good grades. He's that obnoxious frat boy you see in the movies, and a serious player that the girl seems to love. He often brought a different girl home at least five nights a week. It's not uncommon for him to have sex every night. I haven't slept in my own bed since before Christmas. No matter how much I complain, Chaz never changed. I've talked to Solomon, this year's frat president, about changing rooms, but there isn't a room available. Besides, I may be 21, but I'm only a sophomore. If only I was a senior, then I'd have some clout. I'm transferring rooms as soon as one is available. Looks like I'm sleeping on the couch in the TV room. Again. Howard was already there flipping through random channels on our huge flat screen. He's a big guy, and a boxer, and an insomniac. He works events at the Capitol Arena, so he probably just arrived home and is winding down. Grin, our resident weirdness guru, card shark, and magician, is dressed in old gray sweats, has a huge bowl of popcorn in front of him, and is sharing it with Howard. Dane, the smoothie master, is down here as well. His boyfriend, Anders, had a business trip to Japan. Anders is a senior and graduates this year. Dane must be lonely. Chaz kick you out of your effing room again? Howard asked. Never got a chance to go in, I said, and yawned. Grin slid the giant popcorn bowl my way, and I grabbed a handful and slid it back. Grin then said, I'm sorry, but you're about to get bad news. What are you talking about? I complained. This is why nobody likes talking to you, Grin, Howard muttered. You never make sense. Riley, go pack some clothes, Grin said. You're right, Howard, I said. Grin doesn't make sense. My phone rang. It's for you, Grin said. Your life is about to go nuclear. Grin, stop being effing obnoxious, Howard said. 
Grin merely tossed a piece of popcorn at Howard, and Howard somehow caught it in his mouth. Unless the phone call had something to do with the bistro, nobody would be calling me at three in the morning? I checked the caller ID. Except maybe my mom. Suddenly, I felt nervous. A lot of times Grin didn't make sense. But suddenly, he made perfect sense tonight. I picked up the phone to hear Mom crying. And somehow she said, We got home and your dad was climbing the stairs and then he collapsed. I called the ambulance and we're at the hospital now. He's really gray and his lips are blue and they have him on oxygen and he won't wake up. I think he had a heart attack. I'm scared. I was exhausted, but instantly awake. Have you called, sis? Can you call her because the doctor is coming over, Mom said. I'll handle it, Mom, I said. The next few minutes were a blur. I somehow called my sis and my grandparents, grabbed something to eat, and drove to the hospital. I met Mom, and a few minutes later, my sis joined us, and then my dad's parents. It was four in the morning. Dad was in the cardiac critical care ward, unconscious. The doctor confirmed Dad had had a massive coronary infarction and was undergoing multiple tests. The doctor's grim look already told me how bad it was. Head chef and owner of a bistro was as stressful as it got. Top it off that Dad never had time to take care of himself or eat right. And when the doctor later said that Dad had multiple blockages and needed a double bypass, I wasn't surprised. Mom lost it. I'd never seen her get this emotional before. Dad's parents handled the big decisions, and the doctor said, If Dad woke up, it would be at least 12 hours or more. They were doing everything they could for him. The word if horrified me. It got worse when Father Waring with one of his deacons showed up at 5 in the morning, both to offer comfort and give Dad his last rites. We spoke for a moment but his priority was to mom and my grandparents. At six, I went back to the frat house. I'd had no sleep, minimal food, exhaustion flooded every cell, and worse, I had a sex maniac for a roommate who commandeered my room every night. I was dead tired, and I didn't care that there was a tie on the door. I barged into my dorm and turned the lights on. Chaz, sleeping next to some girl, instantly woke up and yelled, What are you doing here? I left the tie on the doorknob. My frustration suddenly flared and I yelled, I'm tired of always waiting for you and your damn needs and how you keep commandeering our room almost every night. It stops now. I was so tired I screamed the last part. I pulled out my suitcase and, and filled it with enough clothes to last me a couple of days. Oh, God. Grin was right. I should have packed some clothes earlier. The girl was awake by then, and I said, You need to leave because I want my room back. By the way, you're Chaz's fifth this week. Riley, stop being a jerk, Chaz yelled. I switched to a weird falsetto voice and mimicked, Chaz, stop being a jerk. I never stopped loading my suitcase. Solomon, our frat prez, stepped into the room and asked, What's going on? I didn't even look at him when I said, I would like to use my room at least once this year. Is that okay with you? I need my privacy, Chaz said. And I need my bed, I yelled back. Grin looked in the room, carrying a stack of cards. I think he knew better than to draw me a card, because I wasn't in the mood. He did ask, what's the word on your dad? Really bad heart attack, I said, suddenly remembering... That grin had told me my life was about to go nuclear. The doctor thinks Dad needs a double bypass. I'm going back to the hospital as soon as I shower and pack a few clothes. Grin walked over and hugged me. Just know we're here for you, okay? Howard hadn't gone to bed yet, but had a beer in hand, and he said, Chaz, can't you stop thinking about your effing self for five minutes? Riley's dad just had an effing heart attack. Some part of me suddenly wondered if this hit Howard hard, because he didn't have a family. Chaz must not have known what to say, because he blurted out, This wouldn't have happened if I had my own room. Chaz, Solomon said, Your girlfriend needs to leave. 
Howard, can you pack a lunch or something for Riley? It sounds like he's about to have a long day. But, Chaz tried to protest, it's my room too. Shut the F up, Howard said. I'll make a couple of sandwiches. There's some Cheetos in the cupboard, Grin said. Those are mine, Chaz said. Didn't see a name, Howard and Grin said at the same time. You guys, I was here before Riley. This is an invasion of my privacy, Chaz yelled. And you're eating my food. Shut the F up, Howard bellowed. Then you should have kept it in your room, Solomon said. Dane suddenly showed up and said, I'll get some coffee brewing. You are all not listening, Chaz yelled. This is my room, and I had a date. Chaz, it was my turn to yell. You will not invite another person to our room for the rest of the year. I'm sick of this. It's your turn to sleep on the couch. I quickly showered, changed, grabbed my suitcase, and ran downstairs. I was too hyped on adrenaline to feel tired. Howard had made chicken and red pepper hummus sandwiches, plus filled a bag with Cheetos. Dane had filled a thermos with coffee, and Grin hugged me as I left. Call us as soon as you know anything. The cards say your life is about to change, and you will find someone to help you. But you need to be strong. It also says the sun will eventually rise again. Let me know when you run out of Cheetos. It hit me. Maybe it was because of something Grin had said. If Dad survived, and he was in the hospital for at least the next week, and on bed rest for six weeks or more, how would we run the bistro? Who would cook? How would I keep up on my classes? I'd have to run our family's restaurant. I'd have to apologize to my frat bros later because I think I had a stress meltdown in front of them. They are my brothers. But thanks to Howard, Grin, and Dane, they were the only reason I was even functioning right now. I got back to the hospital about eight in the morning. Dad still hadn't woken up, and the doctors didn't expect any change for most of the day. He had become a permanent resident in cardiac critical care. The place he was constantly monitored and had his own private nurse and the resident cardiologist checked on him at least hourly. The only plus side was that cardiac critical care had its own private waiting room with its own social worker and nobody under 17 was allowed. Mom was a mess. She had washed the rest of her makeup off because it had turned into an abstract painting. My sister and I notified everybody in the family, and we had to make a decision. What to do about the bistro? We were booked to capacity tonight, and about noon, the chefs would come in to begin prepping for tonight. Mom's phone had contact info, so I called as many employees as I could to let them know. The guys from the frat sent over a floral get-well arrangement, and the crew from the bistro sent a couple of waitresses with a second floral arrangement. Family friends sent a third. Then a couple of ladies from our parish stopped by with the fourth floral bundle and stayed with us for thirty minutes. Solomon and Howard stopped by to see how I was doing with a bag of Cheetos sent from Grin. The entire frat had signed a get-well card, except Chaz. He was mad at me for ruining his midnight escapade. I discovered that I didn't care. Spoke with Chaz, Solomon said. Told him he was on probation for hogging the room. Man needs to learn to share with his bros. You can put somebody on probation like that? I asked. Spoke with the chapter heads, and Chaz has to learn that he isn't the center of the universe. They were the ones that recommended it, Solomon said. You are not effing Chaz's favorite person right now, Howard said. You let us know if you need anything, Solomon said, and they took off. Visiting privileges for cardiac critical care are different than other places in the hospital. One or two close family members are allowed to visit for ten minutes every hour. They become the hospital representatives of a sort and are supposed to post about the patient's condition on social media. Mom was a mess. She went to see Dad every hour. Sis became the family spokesperson. You'll have to handle the bistro, Sis said. Thanks, I said. I already figured as much. 
just a little before noon, as I was heading to my car to go to the bistro, my phone rang with an unfamiliar number. It must be another relative wanting an update. I'd called so many people that my phone was down to a 47% charge. Except for a couple of short naps in the waiting room, I hadn't slept. Riley, said a man's unfamiliar voice, you left me your number last night. I'm Wally Bain. Do you have a moment to talk? It took me a moment to remember that this was the cute guy from last night. Only a minute, I said. Dad had a heart attack and I'm running over to the bistro right now because we open in a few hours and without Dad we're already short-staffed. I stopped by to drop off my application and I heard, he said. I'm sorry things went weird. Look, I said and leaned against my car. I don't have time to date right now. Life has gotten too crazy. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to lead you on. That's not why I'm calling, he said. I used to work as a chef and a waiter and a busser at El Paraiso, a restaurant over in Phoenix. I need a job because I'm moving to Vegas. I can help you out, at least in the short term. If it works out, maybe I can apply for a full-time position. My mind went blank, but I managed to say, I'll need to see references, but the final choice about hiring is up to my parents, at least when things settle down. I'll be a temp, Wally said. Your dad was the chef, right? I can prep like anybody else and show me the recipes and how you do things, and I'll do my best to cook up the right kind of food. With mom and dad and sis not working tonight, we were very short-handed. Before I realized it, my tired brain agreed. We'll talk contracts and hourly rates when I see you. How soon can you be at the bistro? We have to prep for the dinner rush. Give me an hour, he said. On my way to the bistro, I called my sis and got her input. I hadn't seen any references, hadn't seen him cook, didn't know what kind of food he cooked, and worse, hadn't tasted his cooking. I had never heard of El Paraiso in Phoenix. This could either be a miracle in the works or a complete disaster. It was up to me to make tonight work. As much as I had learned, was I even ready for this? No. Dad had been the king, refusing to let anybody else make decisions. No matter what, it was up to me to keep this place going. El Paraiso is the Spanish word for paradise. I'd lay odds that Wally must have worked at a high-end Tex-Mex fusion restaurant. Not the kind of food we serve at Max's American Bistro. But tonight, the bistro will need all the help it can get. I need to stay busy or I'll go crazy worrying about Dad. He still hadn't woken up. Once I arrived at the bistro, I gave the latest news about Dad, and a little while later, Sis called and said that though he was responding to treatment and his heart now had a, um, mostly stable rhythm, Dad still hadn't woken up. The doc said not to worry because people who have severe heart attacks might be unconscious for up to 24 hours. Hadn't he said 12 this morning? I didn't need to hear that. Before Wally showed up, I found the number for the El Paraiso restaurant. The manager wasn't in, so all they could tell me was confirm that Wally had worked there for three years. Finally working his way up to sous chef and had recently quit and moved to Vegas. I took a chance because I didn't have a choice. When Wally came in, I had offered him a one-month temporary contract with the option of long-term renewal based on performance. The rest of the afternoon was a blur. At 10 that night, I needed a break. That night had been the busiest we had ever been. We were still down several people, including Dad, and it meant we had to work harder than normal. But Wally had really come through. My shoulders ached, and I stood outside for a second, trying to relax. My phone had a dozen texts from my sister, all saying the same thing. Dad still had not woken up. The doctors had scheduled an MRI first thing Sunday morning to check his heart again. 
Wally pushed the door open to stand next to me and said, Thanks for giving me a chance. Is this place always this busy? It doesn't slow down on weekends, I said. Why did you leave El Paraiso? He sighed and said, Me and my boyfriend, he was a waiter at El Paraiso, had a bad breakup. I needed a change. What happened? I asked. Wally leaned on a railing, staring at some random point in the distance, before he said, We were going to get married in a few months. We both come from big families, so we were going to have a big wedding and invite everybody. I was saving money like crazy. Thought he was too. Then I caught him stealing money from our joint savings account so he could buy something expensive for his other boyfriend. Other boyfriend? Ouch, I said. Did you get the money back? Mostly. He was using the money for a business trip to Cancun. I pulled what remained of my money out and left Arizona, Wally said. I don't want to be anywhere near him. And so you rebound to Sin City, I said. You up for a late night beer? The bar down the street is open as long as people are drinking, and I'll take you there right after closing. You're on, he said. About two, after getting the bistro ready for Sunday, I locked up and Wally and I went to the bar. We talked for an hour. We talked about old boyfriends, about cooking, about opening a restaurant. As it turned out, Wally wanted to open his own restaurant. We both had the same dream. Maybe we were insane, especially because we didn't know each other. But on a napkin, we planned out an Italian-American fusion restaurant called Bay Tempi. Translated, it means good times in English. Wally came up with a menu on the spot and I scribbled out a business plan. We must have been drunk because it all made sense. Sometime before four, I Ubered back to the frat house. Surprise, Chaz wasn't there. Probably slept over at the girl's place. I let myself into our room and passed out as soon as I hit the pillow. I never got out of my clothes. When I woke, six hours later, I found the napkins with our plans on them and lay awake staring at the ceiling, thinking about Wally, about his green eyes and wavy hair and drinking beer with him and how he stepped into the kitchen and got to work with the other guys. He was easygoing and fun to talk to and it felt like we had instantly connected. Of course that happened on the worst night of my life. I was very attracted to him. Bet that might have been the beers and the extremely late night and the fact I functioned on too little sleep. And he was cute. My phone disturbed me. I answered it and my sister yelled, Riley, get down to the bistro right now. You need to let the food delivery people in and sign receipt of their delivery. It's Sunday, I said. My brain refused to work. So what? Get moving. Oh, and Dad woke up a few minutes ago. He was out for nearly 30 hours, she said, and hung up. Finally, some good news. It was noon by the time the food delivery truck had delivered all the food, and we put it away, and I signed the receipt. Sunday is our gourmet day where Dad makes a ton of delicacies that aren't offered the rest of the week, like crab cake burgers and jalapeno chicken wings with a mango dipping sauce and fish fingers with a custom ranch sauce. We offer an early buffet service starting at 4 and then close at 6, but prepping takes hours, especially the slow-cooked house barbecue sauce, and properly marinating a steak can take up to 8 hours. We use several marinades, all made in-house. The pineapple marinade is one of the most popular, though the teriyaki and the spicy ghost pepper are close. All three were invented by Dad. I had a problem. One of our two side chefs that usually helped Dad was absent. What happened? Why are we down another person? I asked. It's his anniversary this weekend, and he arranged for the weekend off, 
and your dad approved it a month ago, he said. They went to Tijuana, and he said sorry he had to leave, but they have prepaid reservations at a resort hotel. He promised to help when he gets back. Of course, Dad didn't tell anyone. He handled everything. I went from deep despair to a deep depression at once. How can I cope with all of this? I wanted to run my own restaurant, but jumping into my dad's was the most frustrating thing I had ever done. You okay? Wally asked, suddenly arriving. You don't look okay. Too much. Too fast, I said. I am really frustrated. I'm still figuring out how to run the bistro dad's way. I can't do it like he does. He handles everything. Right now, dad runs it all, and with him gone for at least a month or more, how do I keep the bistro from falling apart? Mom can't help, and sis is trying to keep the family running. What am I going to do? Wally took me into the dining area where we had some quiet time to talk. He found a pad of paper at the reservation desk and a pen, and brought them to me. Last night, we came up with some ideas for a future restaurant. Maybe something will come of it. But right now, while we get the food ready for tonight, get your brain moving. Talk to everybody. Who cares who you have to ask for help? And if you have to make changes so you can stay sane, I think everybody will understand. You'll stay and, and help me out? I asked. Only if you take me out for dancing and drinks later, he said, smirking a little. I had an idea. Maybe I could break two windows with one stone. I was not doing very well with my class anyway, so I might as well make the paper serve me rather than the professor. I logged onto the bistro's office computer, logged into my home account, and pulled up the paper. Time to make it useful. For the next two hours, I brainstormed about how I would run the bistro for the next month or two. I wrote about the situation in the paper and suddenly realized Sis hadn't called to update me about Dad for hours. I'd call her on break. Two more hours later, Wally surfaced from the kitchens. It was right before opening. I let him read the paper and what I proposed to do. I would pull one of the waitresses back to help prep food, at least for tonight. Wally offered a bunch of suggestions. Then I spoke with the chefs in back who gave me their input. Finally, the head waitress had arrived, and I let her read what I proposed for tonight. She recommended a different, more efficient table arrangement, streamlined how the wait staff served groups of tables near each other and would run the reservation desk herself while I helped run around and put out fires. And if any customer had an issue and wanted to see the man in charge, I would tell them about Dad's heart attack. When we finally closed at six, I was beyond exhausted. At seven, once the place was cleaned up and ready for Monday, Wally and I went to the parish church to go to Mass with my family. My family were no-shows, but Father Waring spoke to me and Wally for a couple of minutes. After Mass, Wally and I found a bar and talked. Talked about how the day went, about changes we'd make in our own restaurant, and how, overnight, we were becoming friends. It was nice having Wally to talk to and lean on. It was nice having someone to vent to or just shoot the breeze with. He had shown up just when I needed somebody. Sometimes the universe gives you what you need. Or in this case, who I need. Wally would never know how much he kept me sane. When Monday arrived, I took the updated restaurant plan to my professor. He'd hate it because he wanted me to focus on some big company, just like the other students. That kind of paper would be useless to me right now. Suddenly, the true depth of my problems hit me. With Dad gone, I'm not only in charge of food orders and deliveries and prepping for the dinner rush, but payroll, insurance, employee scheduling, and with mom gone, reservations and customer scheduling, not to mention ordering supplies for the bar, like the wine and alcohol, ordering supplies for the front end of the bistro, and then there was building maintenance. How would I stay caught up at college? What about a social life? Oh my God, how do I handle taxes? 
How did Dad do everything all by himself? How will I? All the stress put Dad in the hospital, and he knew what he was doing. I barely know what I'm doing. Dad had done everything. I can't handle all of this. So many people had given me input and advice, but I still had too many issues to solve. It would be nice to have practical tips from my professor as well. Before class started, I handed the professor my paper. He looked it over and scowled. I told you that I wanted you to focus on a bigger company, not your family business. Since I'm running that business, I need your advice on real-world issues, I said, and explained about Dad having a heart attack over the weekend and suddenly making me in charge. As the class filed in, I told my professor about all the issues I was facing and how I needed practical advice, not papers writing about stupid theoretical business models. My professor took a deep breath and said, then let me show you how those business models translate into the real world. Today, this class will be a group discussion. Everybody leave your papers on my desk and I'll get to them later. You all heard about what happened to Riley and his family this weekend? He's become the man in charge and he has some serious business concerns. Let's start with employee scheduling and then move into payroll. But first, no person is an island. Riley, let's talk delegation before the excessive responsibility drives you insane. That class turned into the most useful class I'd ever been to, and I took so many notes that my hand cramped. As soon as my class was over, and before the bistro opened, Wally and I arranged to meet for a light dinner. I told all the things my professor had suggested to Wally when I saw him. Sis called while we ate. Now that Dad was awake, the doctors had Dad slowly walking around, and they made one cardinal rule. No talking about the bistro. Mom spent as much time as she could with Dad. Since Mom wasn't coming in, Sis wasn't coming in either. Oh my God, what am I going to do? The family business was literally all on me. It scared the crap out of me. I hold on to Wally's hand for dear life, trying not to be completely overwhelmed. It meant that for the next six weeks to two months, my family left the bistro to me. What if I failed? I was only a 21-year-old college student. How much could go wrong? Everything. It's my dream to own my own restaurant. I can't do things like Dad. I didn't have his personality, or his brain, or his workaholic work ethic. Somehow he gets people to give a hundred and fifty percent. I'm only me. After Sis hung up, Wally made sure to hold my hand as tight as I held his, and he said, You will survive. I will make sure of it. That one impossible weekend turned into an impossible week, and I only survived it because of Wally. With the help of my frat bros, the people at the bistro, my professor, and especially Wally, I somehow survived. I made a lot of mistakes, but with everybody's help, I made it through. The week turned into a month, the longest month of my life. Grin and Howard and Anders and the rest of my frat bros checked on me daily. The people at the bistro became my family, handling things I had no idea what to do with. My professor walked me through the class, easing up on deadlines and ignoring all the mistakes I made on the papers. Wally let me vent and we talked and we grew close. The doctor informed us that Dad was not allowed to talk about the bistro, still, and we were not allowed to bring it up. His heart was too fragile. There was so much I needed to ask him, but I had to wait until his heart was stronger. Two months in, Dad underwent double bypass surgery and had two stints installed. There was no word when or if he'd come back to the bistro. The word if terrified me. One month turned into two and two turned into a semester.
Albert, our resident genius, helped me learn the new accounting programs. Hutch, with all his surfing stories, kept me distracted. Wally became a permanent fixture at the frat house, and in my life. I needed Wally like I couldn't explain. I depended on him. The team of workers that my dad had put together taught me and supported me until the bistro became our place, almost like our home. My professor had become my mentor, and my frat bros came by all the time. Even Chaz mellowed. Somehow, Wally and I had to make Dad's dream work. If I'm very lucky, no, if we are very lucky, it could become our dream. Three months became four months, four months became five, and somehow five eased into six. How had I survived? Only because of Wally. Only because of the man I loved. It turned into six months before my dad returned to Max's American Bistro. It was a big deal, and we set the place up like we were having a party. Dad and Mom walked into the new and improved bistro for the first time since the heart attack. Dad took one look at the place, and whatever smile he had disappeared. Wally and I and the crew of the bistro had turned it into our vision. The first obvious change was that everybody wore black t-shirts with the logo for Max's American Bistro and the name of the restaurant written on the back. And though not part of the dress code, we recommended khaki shorts. Surprisingly, most people wore them. The staff looked great and it made the place seem a little more professional than the red t-shirts had done. I had learned to read Dad years ago, and he didn't like the new uniforms. Dad walked around the bistro. It was early Friday afternoon, Mom holding his arm. It was lunchtime, and we now ran a lunch service on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. It was a business model, proposed to my professor, and the guys in my class helped me with the details and Wally and the staff helped me put it together. Turns out, a lighter, simpler fare for lunch is a moneymaker, and people liked coming in for lunch on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, like it was their special weekend, guilty pleasure. It also brought in a younger, more professional crowd than dinner did. Dad hated serving lunch. He wanted to focus only on a dinner menu. According to him, because of the wine and desserts, People paid more for dinner, so why bother serving any other meal? Dad looked at the almost filled to capacity lunch crowd, enjoying themselves. The food came from Dad's recipe collection, but Wally had redesigned it to be a little lighter with slightly smaller portions. Not all the ideas came from Dad's recipes. Wally had introduced several types of vegetarian and vegan patties. Turns out, even though a lot of customers preferred meat for dinner, they wanted lighter vegetarian options for lunch. It was a small market, at least for now, but it opened up the bistro to a lot of new customers. Dad hated it. Dad scowled when he saw how we had redecorated. According to him, darker colors made the room more intimate and it should only be decorated to the bare minimum so as not to distract the guests from spending money. We'd done a little bit of remodeling, updating the interior into something brighter and a little bit eclectic, like framed movie posters and framed pictures of movie stars and sports stars and historic places around Vegas. I have to give my frat bros credit. Anders and Dane found all the movie posters. Trust grinned to find weird Vegas pictures, and Howard found a ton of MMA stars. Dad hated it just like he hated the way we had rearranged the tables. It wasn't straight and geometric, and the waiters now worked in zones rather than random tables around the room. Albrecht got in on the action by measuring everything and calculating the most efficient use of table space. He worked with the waiters, working on flow patterns, and even made a computer diagram. It was organic, easy to walk through, and the wait staff loved it. We also had fewer accidents. Dad hated it. We showed Dad the menus, the new lunch menu, the new dinner menu, the new wine menu, the specialty drinks menu, the dessert menu, 
and the new plant-based food menu. While I had developed a few special options for the gluten intolerant crowd, we were still working on that menu. And we were still working on making a diabetic friendly menu. We kept things simple. Only 10 regular things offered daily and then a half dozen specials. It simplified work for the chefs and simplified buying supplies. Wally and the chefs updated the menu for seasonal ingredients every month, but it was all based on Dad's ideas. Dad's eyes grew cold and his mouth grim. Obviously, he hated it. Somehow, he kept his tongue silent and didn't say anything bad. Yet. In spite of all we had done, my parents didn't like Wally, or his ideas, or my ideas, or anybody else's ideas. I showed Dad the accounting spreadsheets from the new programs my professor had introduced me to, and how they simplified ordering, and payroll, and taxes. How, in spite of everything, we had turned a profit. I also introduced him to our new accountant. Dad didn't like change, which meant he didn't like the new programs or the accountant. He was one of Solomon's buddies, and he knew his stuff. Dad hated all of it. Tough. So what? I'd have to tutor him on the program, and he should have hired an accountant years ago. I told Dad about how everything was reorganized into miniature departments. The chefs had their own department, the bussers, the bartenders, the waitstaff, and the host managerial staff, all under the direction of the boss, me. Dad didn't have to run the bistro alone anymore. It also meant that each department was responsible for their own supplies and maintenance, my professor's ideas put into action. Dad hated it. The reservation system was computerized now, as well as ordering, and prevented double booking. We knew at a glance which tables were reserved for customers, or even which customers were repeat customers, and especially important, which meals were popular. Mom didn't like these changes. What's wrong with the old reservation book? All these changes had saved my sanity, and under the table I took hold of Wally's hand. One look at Dad's face told me he didn't like anything. One look at Mom's face told me she was trying to be polite, but she didn't like the changes to the reservation system at all. They had left the bistro to me, and I had to make changes so I could handle this, so I could survive, like the new internet ordering platform and takeout department. That was thanks to Chaz's ideas. Somewhere on this six-month journey, Chaz and I had worked things out. Since Saturday was always so busy for me, he had free reign to bring people over, and I either stayed with Wally in his new apartment or slept on the couch back at the frat. Monday nights were mine, and Wally spent the night with me, and Chaz got the couch. The rest of the week was off-limits to guests, unless it was prearranged. Everybody knew that mine and Wally's weekend was Wednesday and Thursday, we had to have some time to ourselves. I couldn't say how I managed the bistro and my classes. Wally kept me sane, and my professor, even after the classes had ended, mentored me on running a business. We developed a working friendship, and I learned a lot. How did I survive running the bistro? Only with a lot of help. After Wally and I had taken Dad and Mom on a tour of the new and improved bistro, we took a seat at one of the tables, and one of the waiters ran out a plate of cheddar bacon sliders with a spicy mayo and a plate of triple cheese fries with sour cream. We only served sliders at lunch, and it was Wally's idea. It was also one of our most popular lunchtime options. Dad had refused serving sliders. People won't buy them, he had once said. A full burger combo platter will make us more money. First off, Dad said as he took a slider. I don't even recognize the place. You're catering to a younger, poorer crowd, and I don't like all the pictures on the walls, let alone how you've reorganized everything. Dad, I said, nobody can do it all, not even you. If I didn't get everyone to help out, this place would have fallen apart. As much as me and Wally want to run our own restaurant, we can't do it your way. And neither can you the lead waitress said, 
setting another plate of sliders down in front of us. Think of this as a wake-up call, because you are working yourself to an early grave. Dad took another slider and sat back in his chair. He grew quiet and finally said, Riley, you've grown up. Look at the bistro. You've taken it to places I've never imagined. Though I do like some of the things you've done, for example, hiring an accountant, I don't agree with all the changes you made, but I can't argue with the results. You and Wally have updated this place and made it more efficient. I'm proud of both of you for taking an impossible situation and making it work. Wally, welcome to our family. I'd like to offer you a full-time contract. Dad started small, cooking part-time Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Between Mom and me, we never let him work like he used to. He got mad at us many times, but we called his cardiologist to have a talk with him. Mom adapted to the programs a lot easier than Dad did, and she resumed her duties as receptionists. One week after using the computer to schedule everything, she wondered why she had been so hesitant. Except for the need for the accountant, Dad was a lot harder to convince. Dad was a lot less computer literate than I thought. The other chefs often had to take over computer duties, especially with internet orders. Though I remained part of the frat and participated with all their events, I moved in with Wally. It took three years of planning, but we finally started Bay Tempe, our Italian-American fusion restaurant. Dad wasn't happy when we left because he had to find people to replace us. But he and Mom were ecstatic because they got to throw the biggest party of their lives. They catered our wedding. And yes, we served bacon cheddar sliders with a spicy mayo, with a giant Italian cream cake for our wedding cake. All our frat brothers had to come, especially Grin. That man made an insane best man. During his best man speech, Wally and I never laughed so hard in our lives. How did Grin find so many dirty playing cards? The world may never know. The End Thank you, friends, for joining me. I'm Gio, reader and writer of this story. If you would like to hear more original stories about gay men falling in love, please visit my channel at Gio Allred here on YouTube. We'll see you next Wednesday. Peace.